Hey everyone, this is Spoonie Bard, and uh, I've got another dollar store comic book haul. Um, it's a uh, chain of stores called Dollarama uh, in Canada, and right now they've raised the price, um, but all the books, regardless of their size or hardcover, softcover status, are $5 a piece. So, uh, there are some tremendous deals to be had there. Now, they do have Marvel and DC books, but I prefer DC. Uh, before I begin, I do want to shout out and thank a couple of you. Um, first of all, Boomer the Nerd, who has a really cool channel, which I'll link in the description. Um, and then Steve Sayer and Alan C. Thank you guys, all of you, for you know leaving comments and asking questions and stuff. It's been really cool to get that kind of support. And, um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I also hope to do more than just comic book hauls, um, but I just keep finding more and more books. So I don't know if I should just keep doing these until I'm done or if I should just start trying to, like, maybe throw on, like, some reviews or something in the meantime. You guys can let me know. Starting with the oldest uh, pickup from this uh, grouping, we've got The Boy Commandos by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Uh, I believe it was my last video I actually managed to find the Newsboy Legion, which also by them. Uh, they were doing a lot of um, Kid Gang books at the time. Uh, I think it was mentioned because of the popularity of uh, growing popularity of teen sidekicks like Robin and Kid Flash. Um, so what's, uh, actually, sorry, before I forget, what's collected in here is, uh, backup stories from Detective Comics number 74 through 85, backups from World's Finest Comics number 10 through 13, and the, uh, solo title Boy Commandos number 3 through 5. Uh, so these were all being published at the same time, so that kind of tells you how popular this stuff was. Now, whereas the Newsboy Legion stuff had more, like, traditional superhero fare, um, they had the Guardian, who was a costumed fighter that sort of helped them out and protected them. This was more of a ragtag group of kids that, uh, that actually fought the Nazis in the Second World War. Um, so a lot of this, the artwork is, is good, but it's very dark, it's very grim, um... This stuff was originally published in 1943 through 1944. Uh, what was cool is, at the time that this was published, uh, both Joe Simon and Jack Kirby were actually involved in World War II. Joe Simon was in the Coast Guard, and uh, it said Kirby was in Patton's Third Army in Europe. Um, so what they did, like with the uh, Newsboy Legion comics, is they worked like crazy for like uh, a year beforehand and they just stockpiled and banked a ton of stories and then they kind of gave them to their families to submit to the publisher over time so they could still continue to earn money off this stuff while their you know husbands and fathers were off at war now what's really interesting about this is they at the time pioneered something which by today's standards, seems really basic. Uh, and that's the concept of having a full-length comic book story. At the time, in the 40s, uh, comic books were still telling, they, I think the average was 44 pages, and they'd have like three or four different um, smaller stories in there from 8 to 12 pages each. Uh, so it was kind of like a little anthology book featuring the characters just doing different things. Um, but right here, starting with Boy Commandos number four, they say it's the special invasion issue. You can see here, a full length picture novel of the war today. In this one, they told the entire 44 pages told one story and uh, they just split it into chapters. Um, that was a device you, you saw a lot in, even up till, I think, the 60s and the 70s. I recall reading some old, uh, some old original Justice League of America, and they were um, doing this kind of thing, where they would 
divide the stories into chapters. Um, but the first time that ever happened was in this particular book. So Joe Simon and Jack Kirby sort of shaped the way we read modern comics because nowadays you buy a comic book, you expect it to tell one single story over the entire, what do they give you now, 22, 23 pages? Okay, jumping ahead in time, we have the Silver Age uh, book here. Uh, it's Thunder Agents. This is the part of the DC Archives uh, editions. This is volume three. And uh, Thunder Agents, of course, Thunder stands for the Higher United Nations Defense Enforcement Reserves. This is stuff that was originally published in 1966 from a now defunct uh, publisher called Tower Comics. Uh, I know that several attempts in the decades since have been made to sort of uh, reboot the franchise. DC's done it a couple times, and now I think somebody else has the publication rights. Um, anyways, this book contains issues... What? Thunder, Thunder Agents issues uh, 8 through 10, and... Thunder Agent Dynamo. Now that's the sort of the main character here, Dynamo. He got his own sort of spin-off solo book. Anyways, you can see here um, the art is just fantastic uh, by Wally Wood. He did a lot of the covers and the art here, and it just it's just I don't know. I I like this type of art. Um, where the people look realistic, the proportions, there's not like crazy muscles or anything like that. It's it's kind of simple, but still detailed at the same time. Uh, I, I think it's just fantastic. I was really happy to find this, even though I don't know much about the characters or have a particular affinity for them. I think that, uh, you know, just going through this, I might. Now, uh, there is something I do want to add to this. And that's if I can flip back to the beginning of the book. Now you see here, Dynamo Thunder in the Dark, story by Unknown. Uh, story Unknown, Story Unknown, Story Unknown, Unknown. Now if you look at the second page here, there's a lot more unknowns. And down here at the bottom, it does say, Thunder Agents was produced by Tower Comics, the original publisher. Since there are no records from that time, the credits above reflect the most accurate information possible we have been able to determine. So, if I actually go to the first issue here, which is Thunder Agents number 8. Okay, so you see on the cover, there's no credit to artist or writer anywhere. Now, that's kind of nice because you get the full image, but it's not like today where they would be credited. Writer, artist, sometimes the inker. Now, in here, one of the first pages, typically, this is where you'd have the little box with all the credit information, you know, who's the writer, the artist, but also, like, publisher and all that other stuff. Um, there's nothing here. The only reason we know that this is Wally Wood is because, like most artists, he kind of sneaks his signature or his initial into the panel. So, with a lot of these artists, we can tell exactly who they are, and there's enough surviving people to sort of confirm who the artist was. But the names of these writers is, like, lost in history. And that's kind of sad, because, you know, these books are really cool, and um, it's, it's sad that no one will know the names of some of the people who might have produced your favorite issue. Reason I'm excited about this is if you know anything about the DC Archive series is that they do uh, high quality reprints of Golden and Silver Age stories. Now, because of that, they feel like they're entitled to charge, if you can see this here, Canadian cover price is $76.95. Now, that's gone up and down depending on how old the book is, but on average, it's about $75 to $80 to buy a single hardcover copy of this. Now, that is absolutely crazy. I do have a few DC archives, and I have paid... I've got them all used, and I think the only one I actually paid full cover price for was a 
Justice Society of America, um, Volume 1, Golden Age. So uh, this was a real steal because an $80 book and I paid $5 for it. Next up, I have JLA Volume 9. Uh, this is the final volume in collecting uh, the entirety of the JLA run, which started with the uh, Grant Morrison era. Now this collects um, issues of JLA number 107 through 125, and uh, also a lead-in story from Secret Files 2004. Now the first uh, story here is... Um, it deals with the uh, crime syndicate, who are the evil Justice League counterparts from Earth Three, or I think in this uh, at this particular time they were part of the uh, antimatter universe with Cord. Um, so what happens? And this is the lead-in story from the Secret Files two thousand four. Is we can see that. Um, Whatever, they're fighting their versions of heroes, which are our versions of bad guys. And um, anyways, Johnny Quick goes into the future somehow, and he comes back, and he's all freaked out because he says he went to the future one year from now, and there is no future. They have no future. So um, that's kind of what sparks the whole reason they... Um, start trying to come into our universe because they're they're worried that theirs is going to be destroyed. Um, now, what's cool about this is this is the start of JLA 107. They don't do a separation because, again, the Secret Files leads directly into this. Um, they mention here something that's pretty interesting. Um, often a hive of frenzied activity on the leisure... De as the League deals with the world-threatening crises and other uh, emergencies, scant months ago, it was a crucial staging base as the League battled extra-dimensional incursion. Now, what they mean when they say extra-dimensional incursion is um, referring actually to the JLA Avengers event, uh, which was also written by Kurt Busiek, who's uh, writing this particular arc. At the end of that storyline, there was uh, the DC universe was left with like a cosmic egg, and the idea was the egg was supposed to contain the Marvel universe so that um, they could do future tie-ins and whatnot. But I guess with um, them now being controlled by giant corporate entities, we'll never see that again. So. Uh, Kurt brings back the cosmic egg and uses it for a different plot point in the JLA thing, because again, JLA Avengers is unlikely to ever happen again. Um, so it's interesting. Again, uh, if you don't know the crime syndicate, they are like evil counterparts to JLA. Like Superman is, what is it? Like Uberman, where he's like more villainous and uh, Batman is owl man. And, uh, the, the, I think the biggest difference is, like, uh, Superwoman, who's, like, the evil Wonder Woman, I think is actually Lois Lane. But uh, aside from that, um, it's kind of just the evil counterparts of them. You know, the, the story, honestly, was kind of forgettable, despite having all this cool stuff, despite sort of carrying on threads from that really cool JLA Avengers crossover. It uh, ultimately, I don't think it really produced anything memorable. But at the same time, I don't know that it was supposed to because um, it, it really, it was, a f uh, at the time we weren't aware of it, but it was a, a subtle lead into Infinite Crisis because the idea that the crime syndicate don't see a future for their universe because the crisis is coming and it's going to restructure the multiverse. So the next set of issues, which are um, number 115 through 119, this is the Identity Crisis tie-in. Um, if you're not aware, Identity Crisis was the one where they found out that in the Silver Age, um, Zatanna and some of the other uh, classic leaguers like Hawkman and Green Arrow 
uh, they all sort of voted to mind wipe some of the villains who discover their identities as a way to protect their loved ones. And uh, one of the times Batman walked in on this and he was so appalled uh, and they realized they couldn't let that secret out. So they actually mind wiped Batman, which was a really big deal. Um, one of the things that Bat bothers Batman, aside from the fact that um, they tampered with his memory, is at some point he wonders about Catwoman. You can see here, this is where he sort of has this file on her uh, over the years. And it says, for a time, she was part of the original secret society, and one of my most aggressive enemies, and then suddenly she became... A friend? An ally of sorts. I thought she'd changed, but but maybe it wasn't her choice. So, that's upsetting. Not only have they, they effed around with his brain, but the, this, you know, woman he loves kind of thing. Um, she might not even really love him on her own will. So, yeah, this basically um, splits the league apart because... Nobody can kind of trust each other. Batman's pissed at everybody. Uh, like usual, um, Martian Manhunter is like the sole person alive. Or, sorry, uh, the sole person left on the team to sort of pick up the pieces and try to find a new team. So you can see he's looking through a list of uh, former leaguers here, and then he has to update it because Blue Beetle's dead. Um, at the uh, last page at the end, we see... Superman's teleporting aboard, and he's like, what the hell is going on? And then, you know, he screams out in pain, and boom, the watchtower has exploded. Um, this, of course, we find out in Infinite Crisis, this was Superboy Prime. He was coming there to, uh, he was just, he was just messing all kinds of stuff up. Issues 120 through 125 are just dealing with the fallout of the League. Uh, they've been, you know, destroyed figuratively, like emotionally, but also physically their watchtower's been uh, blown up and they are really just beat down at this point. Uh, so the, this arc is basically uh, Green Lantern, or Green Arrow, sorry, trying to hold together the team long enough to defeat the key, an old-time Justice League villain who uh, Morrison actually brought back in a cool way. Um, now, apparently what happened at this point, the key has developed some kind of psychic ability or something, like he's able to unlock the human brain. And um, ultimately what they end up doing, because it's driving him insane, is they trap him in the spirit realm so he can just be at peace forever and not have like other thoughts that he's accessing and stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, the end of this is directly going into Infinite Crisis. And you can see that by the different versions of the Justice League house uh, base. Sorry. You got the Watchtower on the Moon. You got the uh, Happy Harbor Cave, the uh, Hall of Justice, and the Justice League Satellite. Finally, I've got the DC Universe by Brian K. Vaughn. This collects the Titans, number 14. Sins of Justice, Wonder Girls, number one. Backup uh, story from Young Justice, number 22. And JLA Annual, number four. It also includes most of the event of Green Lantern Circle of Fire. It has Green Lantern Circle of Fire, uh, issues one and two, which were the uh, bookends. And it has the two tie-ins out of five, written by uh, Brian Vaughn. And those were the Green Lantern and Adam Strange and Green Lantern and the Atom. Uh, I really don't care for like anthology books with different stories just based off a single writer. But I picked this up because it essentially had um, like half of the Circle of Fire event. And I heard that was a cool one. So that's it for this video. If you made it this far, I mean, thank you for watching. Uh, I know I'm ramble a lot and i'd like to find a more concise way uh to condense these but i just i get really passionate about this stuff um if you got any advice for me or anything you'd like to see me do you know always uh, open to criticism so leave a comment and uh this is the end of video so thanks for watching